Hi, this is Jason Kendall and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Well, last time we did an extended dance remix version of Galileo's struggle to bring the ideas into fruition for modern science. And what we learned was that at the end of this whole thing, he had ended up in trial under house arrest and so forth. But let's actually, I want to do a short uh, discussion on the details of all that and get into the details and see what we can get. So at the end of this, we're going to see where Newton's ideas rise out of. All right. So Galileo, having, having found uh, that the Ptolemaic system is completely dead, because of the phases of Venus. The phases of Venus to him were the key element of everything. The phases of Venus cannot be what they are in the sky through observation without there actually being, a, without the Copernican system or something where the sun is at the center. So Galileo advocated Copernicanism, even though pretty much nobody was doing it by that time. Um, but, but the Ptolemaic system was completely dead because it incorrectly predicted the phases of Venus that are observed. All right. So what happened later is that when Galileo finally published his dialogue concerning two world orders, got himself into a bunch of trouble with the Inquisition and was placed under house arrest for the rest of his life, what he then did uh, with his daughter Celeste, who was a nun uh, and keeping herself away from, you know, possibly dying in childbirth, but being a very intelligent young woman all of her own, uh, she and her father wrote the dialogue concerning the two new sciences. And so this was Galileo's, one of his great masterworks, which he published in 1637. And this is interesting. He was under house arrest. He was told not to publish anything at all under pain of death. That's what house arrest is. And if you're an academic who can't pub whose word was going against the church, this can get you in some serious trouble. In any event, he published this work. And the two subjects that the two sciences he were talking about, one was in the strength of materials, and the other was in the physics of motion how things move, how things accelerate, rotation, things going down inclined planes, and so forth. And he did this while he was under house arrest, and it was published in the Netherlands. Now this is interesting, but the funny thing is, is that nobody really did anything about it. So he was under house arrest, everybody knew he published it, but he was not punished for doing so. And that was part, that may also be part of the perestroika version of the Renaissance, because they just wanted him to be quiet and not be such a troublemaker. And so it's like, okay, here's your really stiff punishment that we're saying we're doing, but in practical terms, let the guy be the guy. He was a very important person. So he was able to publish this amazing work, uh, The Two Sciences of World Orders. And he again had the dialogue between Salgredo, Sal, uh, Salviati, and Simplicio. But this time, Simplicio is not looked at as a complete buffoon. In fact, he's smart enough to carry his own with the other two. Uh, that probably helped to smooth over some of the relations that he had, and maybe that was some wisdom passed from his daughter to him about how to get along in the world. All right, so Galileo published this amazing, this, uh, this final work of his, uh, and, uh, and then comes in, in a, two years later, Jeremiah Horrocks. He utilizes Kepler's laws, and he utilizes notes of Kepler's laws. Jeremiah Horrocks is in England. And he uses Kepler's logs and realizes that Kepler made a prediction for a transit of Venus across the face of the sun or a near-miss transit on December 4th. Jeremiah Horrocks goes back and looks at the mathematics of Kepler and determines there will actually be a full-on transit of Venus on December 4th of 1639 at 3 o'clock in the afternoon local time. Well, Jeremiah Horrocks says, okay, I'm going to do this. I made a prediction. The prediction based on Kepler's laws shows that there shall be a transit of Venus at that moment. Well, it's cloudy that day, but the clouds part at 3.15 p.m. And he's able to make a transit timing and therefore make an estimate of the astronomical unit because the timing of the transits of Venus actually allows you to make an estimate of the, the astronomical unit. And therefore, he gets a pretty good guess. He gets it wrong. But he gets a very, very good guess, and he's less wrong than pretty much everybody else prior to him. But most importantly, he used Kepler's laws in order to make a prediction about the transit of Venus, which was correct. And he had to do some, he had to make some, make some change, some corrections to Kepler's stuff. Everybody needs corrections, it doesn't really matter. And the thing is about Horrocks, though, is that in, for some bizarre reason, everybody in England publishes late. He never publishes his stuff until he dies in 1661. 
But Horrocks is the first person to actually use Kepler's laws to actually make a prediction. And so these, it's becoming quite clear that Kepler's work is the way to go. But in 1641, though, let's go back over to Italy for a second. In 1641, because there's this, there's this great uh, story that everybody hears about Galileo. At 1641, uh, a, a friend of Galileo's, uh, a, a friend of Galileo's, does some exercises. A Jesuit priest goes to Pisa, to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and tries to use, uh, tries to uh, demonstrate that when you take two balls and you draw of different weights, different compositions, different masses, and drop them off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, they hit the ground at the same time. All right. Um, that wasn't done by Galileo. That was done by his friend uh, Renieri, Vincenzo Renieri. Um, and so he then, they, Galileo was very pleased about this, uh, but then Galileo passes away in 1642 and leaves all of his scientific data to his friend Vincenzo Renieri to actually, to Renieri in order to publish and work on, but Renieri himself dies very soon thereafter. And it's their mutual friend, Vincenzo Viviani, who then, then create, who attributes the Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropping things off of Pisa to Galileo. And thus, a legend is born. So that's a wonderful thing to think about, that that occurred. Uh, and that's where it comes from. Galileo himself did not go to Pisa and did not drop things off of there. A friend of his did, and then another friend of theirs attributed it to Galileo, and a legend gets born. See, these things happen all the time, all throughout history. So Galileo has now passed away. Nine years later, in 1651, Riccioli publishes, republishes what he calls the New Almagest. Remember Ptolemy's Almagest, which was a, which was a tour de force of 400 BC, of 480, uh, of a very long time ago, a Greek, uh, Greek astronomer, actually looking for the nature of how things work. But Riccioli says, all right, what he does is he argues and he, he goes through and looks at all the arguments in favor of the Copernican co model of the cosmos and in favor of Tycho Brahe's m model where the sun orbits the stationary earth and everything orbits around that, because those seem to be the two dominant philosophical models. And he puts together side by side all of the arguments but get between Copernicanism and, and non-Copernicanism, specifically geostationary models and heliocentric and geomobile models. This was the book that Galileo was supposed to have written back in the 1630s. So finally it gets written and it's, it's be, it is an incredible influence because it's actually a scientific document, it tries to actually weigh the arguments. And sometimes people say, well, there's more accounts against Ga uh, Copernicanism, so he weighs in favor of it. But it's not really the case. The, the most important thing to remember is that Copernicanism has a really tough thing that it goes up against. And there are two things. One is that if the Earth moves, where's the parallax of the stars? We still have not gotten to that. This is a big, big, big problem. So where's that parallax? And well, you can't say that the Earth moves until you see parallax. And then second, we have the Coriolis effect, which would be, wait a second, if the Earth is rotating, then the poles would be rotating slower in terms of raw speed as opposed to the equator. So if Galileo's idea is to hold, when the, the idea of Galileo is that if you're inside the hold of a ship and you drop something, you can't tell if anything's moving, then if you're at the equator, the dropped ball is moving along with the equator very fast. But if you're up near the North Pole, it's moving very slowly with respect to outside viewers. Both, in both cases, inside of the, in, if you're up in space looking at the ball falling, down, if you're away from the Earth, looking down at the ball, you have a magic lens that allows you to see through the ship and see the ball being dropped. You'd see the ball scooting across like this. That's what you'd see up in space. But now if you see the same experiment done at the, at the North Pole, where the Earth is rotating very slowly because the, uh, the, the, uh, the path that you go around near the North Pole is very short in 24 hours, so your, your actual speed is slower. So that would actually show a smaller speed. So if, therefore, if that's the case, what happens if your ship goes north? Then the then the arc of the um, then the arc, then you should actually experience a change in uh, a change in speed or change in direction. And the Coriolis effect says is that something that moves from the equator north is move, will retain its motion of the equator as it goes north. 
So therefore, it should arc forward or arc eastward as it goes. And if it's coming from, the, from north going south towards the equator, it should arc westward or behind. And so that's the Coriolis effect. And we see that today in the pattern of storms like hurricanes and how they move and rotate. That's the Coriolis effect. It has nothing to do with things going down bathtub drains or, or toilets or, or so forth. It's all about enormous, enormous distances and differential rotation of the Earth. Coriolis effect does not apply to small areas inside of a bathroom. It just, the, the, it's too small a, a difference in speed. If, if that actually worked, your head would spin because you've got a lot of liquid in your stomach. So if that volume would work, then you should feel Coriolis forces inside your stomach, and you don't. Any event. So the Coriolis effect is, is a prediction of a rotating Earth that is spherical in shape. And no one had observed it yet. So when Riccioli actually created this, he said, well, there's two main arguments against geomobility. And the first one is the lack of parallax. And the second one is the basic inability to find the Coriolis effect. These were, of course, later discovered. But this was a scientific tour de force to actually show the equal arguments. And this is what Galileo should have written 20 years prior. In any event, this was a, an important, a, important uh, thing that still kind of favored, uh, favored geostationary, um, the, the Earth being stationary, uh, not necessarily at the center, because everybody was going along with, with Kepler's laws. They said they work really well. So in 1655, Huygens, uh, uh, Huygens invented, created, built a new huge, Christian Huygens built an enormous telescope, looked at Saturn, and discovered the moon Titan. And by the 1660s, everybody had adopted Kepler's laws. Um, and it was very, and basically the only thing they didn't use was the equal areas, equal time thing. They just thought that was silly. And in fact, they found that the tables of the Almagest, or the new Almagest, were easier to work with than the mathematics of Kepler, who was notoriously opaque. So they really, so, you know, use what works, right? And if it works, works. But they really love the Kepler third law, p squared a cubed. They love that, and that worked really well. So ellipses combined with p squared a cubed. The second law they weren't so, weren't so happy about, but yet it was clear that these things worked mathematically. And that makes for a valid theory. But does it make for real science, and does it truly answer the question of the Earth moves? All right, we'll, lay, we'll leave that till next time. When we learn, when we see how in 1687, everything changes with the publishing of Newton's Principia. We'll see you next time.